Welcome to The State of Us. Real people with honest opinions and the future of responsible media. Here's your host, Justin T. Weller. American millennials are approaching middle age in worse financial shape than every living generation ahead of them, despite a decade of economic growth and falling unemployment. Why do you care? Well, hobbled by the financial crisis and recession that struck as they began their working life, the Wall Street Journal reports that Americans born between 1981 and 1996 have failed to match every other generation of young adults born since the Great Depression. They have less wealth, less property, lower marriage rates, fewer children, all according to new data that compares generations at similar ages. That's what we're talking about today. Why do you care? Well, they're about to be the largest generation in American history. That's why you care. And they uh, are going to be the largest voting block as well. They're literally going to determine the future of the nation. But of course, we can't begin this critical conversation without your friendly redneck liberal, Lance Lance Jackson, Jackson. which then affects all parts of politics and economics, correct? Correct. If they become the largest voting block and the largest group, so you can there's, see there's why you should should care. You can see that uh, the topics that we have to get through today in regards to this are economics, education, a birth rate, social security, and marriage. <laughs> see, and I didn't even look at that, <laughs> and you didn't even look at that. So I mean, we hit the economy, retirement, education, property, right? I mean, lots mm-hmm. of things. So. Let's take a look, shall we? We'll start with the economics of the situation. Quote, if I can't afford a home, I definitely can't afford kids, said Joy Brown, 32 years old. She's a renter who is single and earns $75,000 a year. That might sound good, but she also owes $102,000 in student loans and $10,000 in credit card debt. Quote, myself and a lot of my peers still feel like we're playing catch up in the game of life, she said, and she's a compliance officer for the city of Chicago. More than half of the 72 million American millennials are now in their 30s. The oldest will turn 38 this year when their generation is expected to surpass the number of baby boomers. So I'm a millennial, just in case you didn't know. Lance falls in the baby boomer category. And all of the information we're referencing today is from the Wall Street Journal. So the way we're going to take this is I shared some info there, a little dab with Lance. Um, I've got one more piece and then we're going to get his reaction. uh, And then we'll keep going from there on each topic. Wages didn't look much better either for millennials. At the same ages, Gen X men working full time and who were heads of household, heads of households, earned 18% more than their millennial counterparts, and baby boomer men earned 27% more. When adjusted for inflation, age, and other socioeconomic variables. So we take everything to account, Lance. Mm -hmm. Gen X, right? 18% more for men and 27% more for men with baby boomers. Mm -hmm. For women, 12% higher for Gen Xers and 24% higher for baby boomers. So Mm -hmm. pretty substantial margins, yes? Yes. What do you think? Economics don't look great here for the millennials. Well, they came of age during the the last major recession the United States has had, and therefore starting pay was lower, and so it takes longer then to build up and to catch up. And then they were still also being fed the line that education was important and that it didn't matter how much debt you took on, that eventually it would pay off. And there were a few of us out there saying that's not true, but for the most part, that hadn't happened yet. So they've incurred a lot of debt at a time when wages have not been keeping up with the rate of inflation. So obviously, economics are bad. Um, the only piece I will take, well, I guess you really didn't talk about there, but the home ownership thing is the only thing that I would argue with because the idea of the American dream being to own your own home, 
I believe, was created by the government after World War II when they had to have something to do with people after the Great Depression and they were trying to build up the economy and we passed laws and made money available to, for people to own homes because I – please correct me, but I think before World War II, the number of people who rented in the United States hovered between 70 and 80 percent of the population. Much home, higher. Home owning – didn't become part of the American dream until after World War II. And I'm not sure that owning a home is should be a part of that. I think there are a lot of things about owning a home that are not necessarily good for people, um, maybe for the economy, but not good for individual people. I'm not sure that's something that you should strive to do um, as far as for millennials and for people – for people in general, I mean, having been a homeowner and I, I've played the refinance and done a couple of things and, and all that, but I'm not going to see the return on that money. Um, plus all of the, the fix ups and the repairs and the things I've needed to buy to keep it up and to, to do the projects and to do the things, um, around the house. If I had rented all the time, I'm not so sure that I wouldn't have been better off. Economically, so that's the only piece I'll I'll argue, not not argue, but bring up that point that I'm not sure home ownership is is a fair evaluation. But obviously, um, starting your work during or after a recession and incurring high student loan um, debt has not made it easy for them economically to get started. So you kind of tied in there to the home ownership portion. About one third of millennials owned homes in 2016. Might sound like a lot, but compared with half of Gen Xers at similar ages in 2001 and just under half of baby boomers in 1989. So, you know, in the neighborhood of 20% more home ownership by Gen Xers and baby boomers where that number is right around half. The biggest thing that I think this translates to more so than prosperity or something like that that we see is uh, when we talk about net worth, because this is another area that millennials are mm -hmm. lagging sorely behind in. And of course, they're carrying very large debt loads, much larger than the other generations mm -hmm. on average. So you've got that uh, to take into account. The, the big issue is you have generations like baby boomers who are carrying the debt from their homes, mm -hmm. but that's a secured asset. So that debt isn't nearly as risky in that from a, from a financial standpoint and from our financial landscape, right? The bank looks at it and says, well, nah, I mean, even if they default, right, we're going to get at least most of our money back mm -hmm. probably. Student loan, you know, all of a sudden, not really. I mean, there's not an easy, there's not something like a house where you can say, I'm going to turn around and sell this and get the money back. Right. If they don't pay you, there's only so much you can do. I mean, yeah, you can go after them, but again, they don't own homes. You know, their largest assets are their cars typically, mm -hmm. and that's not going to make up a hundred thousand dollars in student loans or right. more, you know? So I think part of what we see here with the, the struggle is when you're in this this cycle, uh, because you can't own a home, the large portion of unsecured debt that you're carrying is more risky because mm -hmm. you don't have the assets to offset this large risk that you're taking. And to get these high paying jobs, like we talked about, you know, I was thinking when I read this, we talked about Joy Brown earlier, who's 32 years old. She's a renter who's single and earns 75000 a year. 75000 sounds like, no, no, yeah, that's pretty, I'd take it, right? I mean, I'd be okay with that. But part of what you have to take into account is where is she living mm -hmm. and how much is her rent? Right. You She's know, living in the city of Chicago. Right. Um, and in the city of Chicago, rent is, I mean, you could, and this is where I think the argument for the house comes back into play of, again, it, should that be part of the American dream? I think we've concluded before, no, that shouldn't be a thing that's part of it because it's not sustainable in the long term to say that that's what everybody should have. But when you look at somebody like her making that kind of money, she could probably own a nice home for what she's paying in rent and be putting it into a secured asset 
you know, where. But see, that's where I, I'm sorry, but that's where I disagree because once you buy the home, now you have, you have repairs that mm-hmm. you'll have to make. You have lawn care, whatever, depending on what kind of home you're buying, gutters, roofing, yeah. furnace, air conditioning. Okay. If you rent, you don't have those costs. Correct. So I understand where you're coming from as far as, well, it's a secured and all this kind of stuff, but I'm not so sure she's better off financially if she don't a home just because the mortgage payment would be less than the rent because you have to factor in all of the other things you have to have or pay for mm-hmm. as a homeowner. Property tax. Into it. Well, I mean, I don't give me that other one because the property <laughs> tax is part of your rent. Mm. The people who own that property, if their, if their property tax goes up, so does your rent. Mm-hmm. And there's not just like, just like with, with the president and, um, China and everything else, the goods go up, you know, the, ta- we, we, the tariff, if the tariff rate goes up, we're going to pay more for goods. Right. If, if you're renting from someone and their property tax goes up, your rent goes up. That's just, that's just the, the, the cost is just passed along. My point is the one thing that people do is what you just did. And that is, well, if I buy a house that I pay less each month than I do, if I rent, I'm not going to argue that fact. My point is, though, when you factor in all the other things you have to pay for as a homeowner, Mm -hmm. that then your mortgage payment plus all the other costs of being a homeowner are going to make you pay at least as much as you do in rent and possibly more. Yep. Which then means bottom line, here's my bottom line kind of guy that I am, the bottom line is you're worse off economically at the end of each month being a homeowner than you are if you rent. I think it'd be a good show because, I mean, we've discussed this before again in the context of topics like this. It would be good for us to do some work, maybe get our producer on this to find us a guest who's spent some time studying these numbers more than Lance and I have because I think it would be really interesting to figure out, you know, typically, right, over the historical time period where homeownership's been kind of a fixture of society, once that home is liquidated, you know, at the end of its life, in other words, Lance buys it when he's 25, right? And he sells it when he's, I don't know, 60. Okay. So it's paid off and sells it. Taking as much of that into account as we can, all of these costs associated with owning it, which again are often overlooked because it's easy to say, well, you know, I pay $1,100 a month for my apartment. I can have this home for $600 a month. It's a great deal. Right. But you also have a lot of time there too that you have to factor in because it isn't just, I mean, Lance was bringing up all the material costs, but you have some, you're, you also spend a lot more time typically, unless you're, again, unless you're going to pay people to do those things. Which is still a cost. Which is then, then again, you're increasing the material money that is going out. But you have to think about what's your time spent, for example, mowing, you know, where if you don't have an apartment. So anyway, I think it'd be interesting for us to planting don't get flowers, too far off on that, but fixing windows. Mm-hmm. Um, and how much of it you do yourself again versus, because then if you don't do it yourself, you pay somebody to do it. And if you do it yourself, it's your time. And not to say your time's not worth it. My point is, I think there's a whole conversation there. And it'd be really interesting to see if either the data is available or we can find somebody who can talk some about what really is the definitive answer to this question on, you know, typically speaking, because obviously there's cases where it works great for people. And then there's cases where it's just awful and they would have been way better off. Is it one of those or is it some, is it murkier than that? I don't know, but it would be interesting to find out. Um, So let's move on, Lance, to education, because you also talked a little bit about Mm -hmm. this and where the debt comes from. Um, millennials as a group are better educated than any generation before them. About four in 10, ages 25 to 37, hold at least a bachelor's degree compared with about a quarter of baby boomers and three in 10 Gen Xers when they were the same age. Those college diplomas, however, have come at a high price. The average student loan balance for millennials in 2017 was $10,600, more than twice the average owed by Gen X at a similar age, according to Mr. Kurz and his Fed colleagues. Um, by the way, this data that we're sharing is from the Federal Reserve. Mm-hmm. So again, like so much of this data we share, you may not like the conclusions we're drawing, but please go verify the data. Right. You can find it. Your government's releasing it. So 
it's not we're not making this stuff up. It, it's coming from reputable sources. Mm-hmm. So and it's coming from the Wall Street Journal, from the Fed, but you can verify it, I'm sure, directly with the Fed if you if you want to. So this this one's interesting because it plays to what we've talked about before, right? With this, like you said, this notion they've been sold that it doesn't matter how much your degree costs because right. once you have the degree, you'll be fine. Mm-hmm. And again, what this data is showing us is I it's it's difficult for me to just say, well, you just I'm just gonna blame my parents for that false notion. Yeah, they sold it, and yeah, it's not really true. Be, but the circumstances are different. It was true mostly mm-hmm. for them because right. the most you'd pay was significantly less than the least that most millennials will pay. Mm-hmm. You know, so it was more realistic because they were carrying less overall debt to do things like buy a house, right? Correct. And it was more reasonable to make expenditures that secured their life. And you see, home ownership is often tied to what we've seen in the past more likely to have more children, Mm -hmm. right? Or children at all. Um, The longer that people are in apartments, the less likely that opportunity is that they're going to choose to build a family. So that ties into the birth rate. That's why I bought a house Mm -hmm. was we had, we had one child in the apartment and we were expecting a second one. And so we looked to buy a house. I mean, they they do go hand in hand. I I understand that. and, And I agree with that. Yep. Well, because Typically, the thinking is you need more space. Right. I mean, if you're going to have more people, often people look at whether or not they can afford it, that they want more space uh, and, a, you know, and a place for them. So that to me is none of these so far that we've talked about. I don't think any of them are like the thing, mm-hmm. right? That if we fixed that, everything's fixed. But so far, and we've got a couple yet to talk about birth rate, social security, marriage. This education one to me is the biggest one. And that might be bringing, you know, my own bias into it or being a millennial and knowing the people that I know who have been through this. Mm-hmm. Um, but I I don't think that any of these others are as much to blame as as my fellow peers being sold the idea that it's okay that you don't know what you want to do. Go to college anyway, get a degree and everything will be fine. It hasn't worked out very well for them. Right. You know? um, and it has for some. I mean, that again, that is not to say that there aren't millennials who followed this course and it worked out exactly the way that it was billed. But I think even the ones who knew what they wanted to do, a lot of them have faced either finding the job, right, or they found the job, but they're not really thrilled about where the job is or who mm-hmm. they're working for. Um, so there's always those components, but I think it's plagued us more than – more than any of us realize right now. Because again, it's all relative to the amount of debt you're carrying. You know, Lance does this, has ten or twenty thousand dollars in student debt, right? He can work hard at a place he doesn't really like, knowing that, hey, I'll have this debt paid off in, Mm -hmm. you know, a few years. And then I can do, you know, then I can start crafting the life I want. It's a whole other story when you've got six figures plus, right? right? As much as almost buying a house or more in some cases, then it's a different story. So on that note, Lance, again, we've got birth rate, social security, marriage, all of this stuff coming up, but we have to take a moment and remind people why we're doing this. Why are we here? Why are we here? What are we doing? Well, our mission is to educate people by providing honest, open, and respectful conversations on whatever the given topic is that the editorial staff chooses. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Agreed. I think we're doing. I think we're doing a pretty good job. I, I try. I told you about that. The, the lady mm-hmm. that uh, took time the other day, right, to mm-hmm. to approach me and let me know that they were they thought we were doing a good job. So I appreciate Grandma telling you that. That's right. <laughs> well, right for anybody out there listening. No, I might. You know, sorry. Full disclosure. My grandparents are no longer with with us. So it wasn't my grandma that said that. It was a very nice lady uh-huh. um, who started listening. Around the first of the year, and has, has and really enjoys um, our topics and yep. how we try to present things. And I don't know; I didn't speak to her. I won't put words into her mouth that she agrees with everything we say, but she likes to hear us discuss the topics and the topics that we choose. So, yep. we appreciate that very much. And she reinforced part of I think what we're trying to do, which is <clears throat> she'd shared that you know a lot of this stuff 
she didn't even know was going on. Right. Uh, and I, and I hope that that's a number of the reasons that some of our listeners tune in is, you know, we veered away more, I think recently from so much of the, this is what's happening that the mainstream media is covering because we know you can get that from 10 other places. Mm -hmm. Um, and what we're hopefully trying to make sure we're bringing to your attention are the things that don't get as much attention or again, the right kind of attention so that hopefully you're better informed about them. And that leads to, uh, ultimately a, a more educated, right, as part of our mission, more educated populace, which leads to all kinds of other good things. So on that note. You know, the one thing, though, and I want to say, and this is kind of going back, getting this back started, speaking of my own children, they were lucky enough that my wife and I were able to help them some with their education. Mm -hmm. And then they worked as RAs and worked their way quote air quotes around that through college by getting, you know, their room for room and board for a cheaper price because they were working so many hours a week running a floor or a building or whatever. Right. On top of the fact that they worked hard in school and chose a place to go to school that gave them an academic scholarship on top of that. But they were able to graduate without any kind of significant debt. However, that hasn't made it easy for them to get started because pay's so low and right. price, you know, and, and home prices are so high that even though they came out, I mean, I can't imagine the shape they'd be in if they had come, come out with some student debt. You know, my oldest daughter had a little more debt because she went to grad school and incurred some debt at the end of that, even though um, she got the school part paid for and lived a very, uh, GA type life, you know, where you're living on less than a thousand dollars a month. I mean, basically, you know, and especially, uh, in Orlando, Florida, where she was no. going to grad school, you know, uh -huh. uh, she, she lived very, as she said, I didn't go hungry, but I didn't have money to go do anything else. Right. Because part of most of her stipend was towards a, um, to a local, uh, grocery store. <laughs> so she said, you know, I always had food, but I didn't have money to go to the movies or to do other things that people her age were doing, you know, but I just, I don't know how people are making it with the student debt because my daughters fall into this category and they don't have the student debt and they're not, they're not horribly off, but they're not flourishing either. So they're I mean, not where you would expect them to be with no coming out of college with no student debt and both being in, white collar positions mm -hmm. or where you were at the same age. Right. I mean, and I think that's the biggest thing because Lance and I, sorry, <laughs> we have to, <laughs> the producer is going to be upset. Um, I'll, I'll share this when we come back. That's their role, isn't it? Yes. To be upset. That, that is okay. their job. All right. it, we, have, we have a job to do. They have a job to do. Sometimes they coincide. Sometimes <laughs> they don't. The conflict. So he's warming up. Uh, but we, we've got more, right? And we've still got birth rate, social security, and marriage. And this all ties back to, I think, what Lance and I have been talking about, which is that, and that's when you look at our mission, right? Educating people is part of our mission because education opens the mind. But there is an extent to how much good it can do if the other levers are not in the right places. And I think that's what this indicates. You have more of them with college degrees than any other generation, and it's not translating into more money. Into economic independence. Right. To the levels that previous generations had. Right. Or even the generation after them mm -hmm. is having. That Right. Yeah. I mean, Gen Z, it'll be really interesting to see how that's handled and the, the children of millennials. And we haven't know? even gotten into it. This may be a two-part show because we haven't even gotten into what I think is the most Im important issue. And that is the ramifications for all this. Yeah. That down the road when I'm gone, what's the economic you know, how does this affect or how will this affect the economic condition of the nation in the next 30 to 40 years? That's where I think this is, this is the important part of today's is not to, because some people probably who, who follow this would, would say the woe is me attitude of millennials. I think we're trying to point out, no, it's a legit yeah. thing that they're saying. It is legitimate. <laughs> it's a reasonable complaint. And so maybe that's the most important thing. But to me, the really the most important thing is, okay, if we all accept that this is a reality, what's the future of the country economically? And it doesn't look good. No. And that's, and that's where now 
we have to find some solutions because we can't really solve the, and I'll open up a can of worms and I'm not trying to, we really can't solve the fact that they took on a large debt to go to school. We can't solve necessarily the fact that they've started behind the eight ball in the first eight to 15 years of their earning career, which is almost impossible to make up. Right. Um, we can't necessarily solve that, but some of the problems that are going to be caused in the future, we need to start fixing some of these problems now so that we don't have the problems don't get exacerbated in the future. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, I mean you, you want to, to avoid me, that's the, the bigger, snowball. That's the bigger story, right? Yeah. We put these people in a rough go and we can make it better. But if we don't make it better, then things are not going to be worse off for them as they reach their golden years. But the whole nation is going to be affected mm -hmm. because of decisions they're having to make because they've been put behind this eight ball to start with. So we've got more birth rate, social security, marriage, and of course, what the heck do we do about all this? But before we get to that, we've got a quick word from one of our sponsors. Welcome back. For the first time in American history, a slight, keyword slight, majority of millennials now favor socialism over capitalism. And this may be upsetting to some of you out there. It's not thrilling to me, but hopefully what you've been seeing so far and what you're going to continue to hear for the rest of this episode is reinforcing why that might be the case. Capitalism is failing them. And the only way it changes is if we are prepared to do something about it. Uh, this great experiment that we conduct as a nation is only successful as our weakest links are. And we've got a big weak link right now, what is about to be the largest generation in American history. So <laughs> that's, a, that's a big weak link. Mm -hmm. um, and the bigger that link is, boy, the uh, the harder it is for everybody else as a result of what could happen. So the birth rate. Now we've known this and we've talked about this before, but just to reiterate, millennials helped drive the number of U.S. births to their lowest levels in 32 years. That means fewer workers in the future to support, tying into our next point, social security and other public programs for ballooning population of retirees. Social security last month, so this is from the Social Security Administration, mm -hmm. Estimated that in 2035, after nearly all baby boomers retire, there will be 2.2 workers per beneficiary. Last year, there were 2.8. The current birth rate of around 1.8 children per women is expected to create a social security deficit of nearly $2 trillion over the next 75 years. So big implications here right? I've said before, I'm not sure that the answer, I think, I think it's the wrong to say the, the best answer to fixing our social security problem is we got to have more people, mm -hmm. you know, because yes, that would fix it, but it creates all kinds of other, other problems. Issues. Right. We're already facing the potential of an overpopulated earth. We may already be there. How do we feed everybody? I mean, there's all kinds of implications to, well, we just need more people. Um, so I'm not suggesting the Wall Street Journal did a disservice by implying that, but I can see how people from those numbers would say, well, millennials just need to have more children and everything will be fine. Eh, everything will be fine for Social Security, but there's a lot of other things that become <laughs> problems. Well, and if you're not making as much money as people have historically, why would you bring in more mouths to feed? Yeah. Less I, money um, and more debt. Right. I mean, that doesn't seem... I mean, children provide a lot of free, good feelings. I mean, having children, being able to um, dote on them and to love them and them loving you back, there's a lot of intrinsic value to that. But the bottom line is rearing children properly costs lots of money. I mean, you know, all the things you have to provide for them. And you're, you're, you're talking about a group of people that we just spent 20 minutes discussing are behind the ball economically. So to ask them to bring in more people to a world that they don't look at very favorably to, to begin, begin with, with is really asking a lot yeah. of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, and there's other ways, not that, not for this show, but there's other ways to take care of the worker problem. 
Yes. You don't have to have, you don't have to force it on them. You know, look at your children or your grandchildren when they come to, to dinner the next time at your house and say, you know, you really need to start having babies so we can get this economy fixed around. That's not what we need to do. And again, it creates other, it can mm-hmm. fix a problem, but in doing so, it will create all these other issues. Um that I think is the big, right? The big thing from this millennials are children of baby boomers who were the largest generation. And it's, and then you just have this spiral of these increasingly larger and larger generations. And at some point we're bursting at the seams and then we've got really tough challenges. And if you're, right? frust- and if you're frustrated with your economic state of affairs and the political state of affairs, why would you want to bring people into that mess? Mm-hmm. Whereas with me, things were good and I could see things getting better. So it's like, yes, let's, let's bring children in. This, and, and, and that's not the answer to fix social security. No. The, anyway, I mean, I've got two or three answers, but that's not this show, I guess. But. That That's not the one. Okay. Right. Or not the best one. I mean, right. again, it could work, but there's other, there's other better options to drive home. What we've talked about today, we're going to end with a short personal stint. And I just want Lance, as, as I'm reading this to think about how this is different than when you were this age and when you were considering marriage. Mm -hmm. For the Cochran's, the price was personal. Joseph Cochran, a real estate manager, proposed to Tasha Brown in 2012. She said yes. Then Miss Brown, a consumer finance attorney, realized that combining their salaries as a married couple could drive up their income-based student loan payments. They ditched their wedding plans but forged a life together. Each wear wedding rings. Miss Brown, 36, legally changed her name and became Miss Cochran. The couple run a financial advice website, wilting away at their combined student debt of $377,000. Quote, if we had zero student loans, we'd be married. End quote, Miss Cochran said. Quote, we have to be far more strategic and creative in order to try to fit everything in and around our student loans. End quote. Their strategy involved moving from Philadelphia to Maryland four years ago. Miss Cochran struggled to get pregnant, and the couple chose a state that mandated insurance coverage for in vitro fertilization. The Cochrans now have a three-year-old son. The family takes a more practical view of higher education based in part on hard-won experience with their jobs and school loans. So the choice, right, mm-hmm. is... We're not getting married because we can't afford what it will do to our student loans. Yeah, my story is about my story is about 180 degrees opposite of that as far as marriage is concerned. Um, Got married at the age of 21 and had not finished school yet. Worked. uh, My wife and I both through um, while we were married finished college. Me two years, her three years, while we were married mm-hmm. and working, um, put off having children for um, a longer period of time, had children much later because we were paying, but we could work and still go to school. Then we had our children, and while our children were preschool age and early elementary, both worked and paid for our master's degrees while our kids were young. So they basically, as they've said, getting a master's degree was never told to them. It was just, they always kind of thought it was expected of them because they watched us <clears throat> as a married couple, both go to school uh, and work on our master's. So, um, and, and we were able to pay it off as we went. I mean, being married and, maybe even helped. Um, probably. But again, we did without a lot. Right. People around us were doing, quote, much better. They were going on vacations. They had newer cars. They had nicer furniture. They had, you know, I, I mean, I joked with my wife, uh, and it wasn't really a joke, that she had to wait almost 15 years, and she can probably correct me when she listens to the show, but I think it was 15 years before she could buy a new piece of furniture. We were married 15 years because everything else was just hand-me-downs. Yeah. I mean, somebody was throwing away a couch, we went and got it. But now you're doing better than those people. But now, who had now nice we're things. better than all those other people. Right. Yeah. You know, we sacrificed at the beginning and now we're, now we're to a point where 
if she retires next year, like she said, um, I retired at the age of what? 54. And she's going to retire at the age of 57. Yep. So, you know, uh, but a totally different, different story. Um, but there was a lot of, but the sacrifice was the same. That's where I will say th- there's similarities. The sacrifice was the same. The first 15, 20 years we were married, we didn't have a whole lot, you know, and we scraped things together and, and, you know, kids had clean clothes and new clothes, but they weren't name brand clothes. Right. You know what I'm saying? Those kind of things. So the struggle was there, but we were able to pay it, pay it off and get there to where now we're financially set. And by no means are we traveling to Hawaii or any place. I mean, we haven't done any of that kind of stuff, but we could take our kids on vacation once a summer. And yeah, like I said, help them pay for school and those kinds of things, which again, that's a choice. Mm-hmm. That's a choice because I have relatives out there who've said, yeah, well, nobody helped me pay for school. So if my kids want to go to school, they're going to, they're going to have to pay their own way yeah, and incur the debt. Cause that's what I had to do. And my, my wife looked at me because her mom and dad didn't help her like they said they would. And she said, I want to make sure that our children can get their college education and that we help them. Well, she said that when we had them. So then we spent the next 20 years sacrificing to right. make that happen. Planning for that. Right. So if we take that money that we spent on them, and that's one thing I tell her all the time, if we had taken that money that we spent on their education and we had invested it, yeah. we'd be in hog heaven right now. Right. But on the other hand, and this is where there's satisfaction, our daughters are out on their own being more successful than the average millennial because even though they feel pressure and and struggles right. economically. They're better off than most of their contemporaries because they didn't have to take on their college debt. And I would have felt that I was not a good parent had I not been able to set them up that way. So it was well worth it for us to sacrifice to enable them to be able to get the more positive start on their life than many of the people in their age group. Two bright notes, and then we're out. Employers have told... Told you it's a two-part show. (laughs) Employers have said that the desire of millennials for on-the-job feedback shows that they're eager to improve their skills. Another bright spot, millennials are entering their prime earning years just as baby boomers retire. That should fuel demand for their skills and lift their earnings. The job market is so much better, so much stronger than it was 10 years ago said one of the researchers at the Fed, and that's a huge benefit. We'll see if it's enough. And of course, we've got more to talk about in terms of what the actual solution is. But right now, Lance, we've challenged people to tune in and listen, right? Mm-hmm. Be better educated, mm-hmm. hopefully hopefully be better informed about issues. What are the ways they can do that? Well, they can use Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else fine podcasts are found. For the state of us on True Chat in Urbana, I'm Justin T. Weller. And I'm Lance Jackson. Thank you so much for tuning in. Be the change.